Dear congregation, let us turn in God's holy word to 2 Kings chapter 4. In 2 Kings chapter 4, we recognize in the first seven verses that Elisha is, does a great miracle for a very poor widow whose creditor was coming to the house to really take her sons to be slaves as a payment for her debts. And Elisha grants a miraculous delivery from this oppression by calling her to bring the vessels uh, and fill the vessels with the oil that she has. And the oil didn't run out until they were full and she could sell it all and pay her debts and her sons and her could live on the rest. Amazing salvation through Elisha. His very name means salvation. And so here now we turn to not only a poor widow, but also now in verse 8 we find a notable woman from Shudam who has a husband and, and she's very wealthy. And yet Elisha also does great things for this wealthy woman. Let us hear God's word, 2 Kings 4 verse 8. Now it happened one day that Elisha went to Shunem, where there was a notable woman, and she persuaded him to eat some food. So it was, as often as he passed by, he would turn in there to eat some food. And she said to her husband, Look now, I know that this is a holy man of God, who passes by us regularly. Please let us make a small upper room on the wall, and let us put a bed for him there, and a table, and a chair, and a lampstand. So it will be. Whenever he comes to us, he can turn in there. And it happened one day that he came there, and he turned in to the upper room and lay down there. Then he said to Gehazi, his servant, Call this Shunammite woman. When he had called her, she stood before him. And he said to him, Say now to her, Look, you have been concerned for us with all this care. What can I do for you? Do you want me to speak on your behalf to the king or to the commander of the army? And she answered, I dwell among my own people. So he said, What then is to be done to her? And Gehazi answered, Actually, she has no son, and her husband is old. And so he said, Call her. And when he had called her, she stood in the doorway. Then he said, About this time next year you shall, re shall embrace a son. And she said, No, my Lord, man of God, do not lie to your maidservant. But the woman conceived and bore a son when the appointed time had come, of which Elisha had told her. And the child grew. Now it happened one day that he went out to his father, to the reapers, and he said to his father, My head, my head. So he said to his servant, Carry him to his mother. And when he had taken him and brought him to his mother, he sat on her knees till noon and then died. And she went up and laid him on the bed of the man of God, shut the door upon him, and went out. And then she called to her husband and said, Please send me one of the young men and one of the donkeys, that I may run to the man of God and come back. So he said, Why are you going to him today? It is neither the new moon nor the Sabbath. And she said, It is well. And she saddled the donkey and said to her servant, Drive and go forward. Do not slacken the pace for me unless I tell you. And so she departed and went to the man of God at Mount Carmel. And it was when the man of God saw her afar off, and he said to his servant Gehazi, Look, the Shunammite woman, please run now to meet her and say to her, Is it well with you? Is it well with your husband? Is it well with the child? And she answered, It is well. Now, when she came to the man of God at the hill, she caught him by the feet. But Gehazi came near to push her away, 
But the man of God said, Let her alone, for her soul is in deep distress, and the Lord has hidden it from me and has not told me. So she said, Did I ask a son of my Lord? Did I not say, Do not deceive me? Then he said to Gehazi, Get yourself ready and take my staff in your hand and be on your way. If you meet anyone, do not greet him. And if anyone greets you, do not answer him. But lay my staff on the face of the child. And the mother of the child said, As the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So he arose and followed her. Now Gehazi went ahead of them and laid the staff on the face of the child. But there was neither voice nor hearing. Therefore he went back to meet him and told him, saying, The child has not awakened. When Elisha came into the house, there was the child lying dead on his bed. And he went in, therefore, shut the door behind the two of them, and prayed to the Lord. And he went up and lay on the child and put his mouth on his mouth, his eyes on his eyes, and his hands on his hands. And he stretched himself out on the child, and the flesh of the child became warm. He returned and walked back and forth in the house and again went up and stretched himself out on him. Then the child sneezed seven times, and the child opened his eyes. And he called Gehazi and said, Call this Shunammite woman. And so he called her. And when she came in to him, he said, Pick up your son. So she went in, fell at his feet, and bowed to the ground. Then she picked up her son and went out. Amen. May God bless the reading of his precious and infallible word and add his blessing also to the exposition of it. Dear congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, a common question that we might ask one another is, how are you doing? And we oftentimes expect an answer, I'm doing well. Good. Thank you for asking. And yet many times you know this person maybe has various difficulties in their life. And most of us probably wouldn't expect a half an hour discourse and all of your difficulties and challenges, aches and pains. And yet we answer, it is well. I'm doing well. One time I was serving a congregation as a student for the seminary, and <clears throat> I was actually called to go to the hospital to a woman who just found out that she had bone cancer again and was lying in the hospital with pain that I had never witnessed before, even though my father had passed away from cancer as well. Her whole body was just writhing in pain. I had never witnessed anything like this in all of my life. And being a novice to such situations and really not knowing what to say, what do you think I asked? How are you doing? What was so amazing was her answer. She suddenly seemed to be free from all the pain and looked right in my eyes and said, I am doing fine. I am doing well because I belong to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. Well, I don't think you need to guess who ministered to who in that hour. She ministered to me far more than I could have ever ministered to her. And yet we are all asked this question. Is it well? We're asked that in baptism as we bring our children in baptism. And right away in our confession, we say our children are conceived and born in sin and are by nature children of wrath, subject to all the misery sin brings. We would probably say it is not well. In the Lord's Supper, we examine ourselves and we ask ourselves, is it well? And we see sin in our lives and challenges and and sometimes we have to confess it's, it's not well. Sometimes we're coping with afflictions and we ask ourselves, is it well? And we're focused on our afflictions and, and we might confess it is not well. 
Well, the secret to knowing whether it is well for us is to know the grace of God by faith. And that's really what our passage here in 2 Kings 4 wants us to see of this Shunammite woman. And as as, um, in verse 26 says, she comes to Elisha, and Elisha says to Gehazi, go out and and please run and meet her and say to her, is it well with you? Is it well with your husband? Is it well with the child? And she answered, it is well. Even though her son had died. I'd like to look at this question, is it well, with three thoughts. First of all, that it is not well in in way of tested faith. Secondly, it will be well in way of a confident faith. And thirdly, it is well in way of rewarded faith. Well, what do we know about this Shunammite woman here as we turn to 2 Kings chapter 4? Well, we recognize, first of all, that the Scripture tells us that Elisha went into Shunem, so she's from Shunem, and that she was a notable woman, a very wealthy woman, one that you might say that Elisha wouldn't naturally gravitate toward as such a plain man himself. However, this woman from Shunem, which the word Shunem itself means it's a place of double resting. It's a double resting place is actually literally what that word means of Shunem. She persuaded him to come in and to have a meal with her and to rest for a while. As I pointed out earlier when we read our Scripture passage, the first seven verses, Elisha's met meeting a very poor widow whose creditor was about to take her sons to be slaves. And yet, as they gather all of these vessels together and the oil never runs out of her jar, she's able to sell all of those vessels and pay off her debts and her families could live in peace. In contrast to this very wealthy woman, we see something going on here in this passage. We see that Scripture itself warns many times about the dangers of wealth. And yet, we see in this account, in this chapter, that God is a God of the rich and a God of the poor alike. And however we do recognize, this woman is not one to hoard her riches, and yet with her heart of generosity toward the poor and toward the kingdom of God, she is richly blessed. This woman was very hospitable. She invited and persuaded Elisha to come in and have some food with her and her family. And she tells her husband, this is a a holy man of God. We we need to make a little room for him in our home. The Lord has blessed us with so much, we could dedicate a little room for him so that when he's passing through, he has a, a place to rest. And her husband agrees and builds the room. And one time, as Elisha's there along with Gehazi, he, he's wondering, what could I now do for this woman who's, who's showed so much concern and care for me? How can I now reward her? And he asks the Shunammite woman, she, he says, hey, could I ask the king to do something special for you? Or could I ask the commander-in-chief to do something special for you? And what do we find in this woman? We find a very content woman uh, with the blessings that God had given her. You see, someone who would have been greedy would have said, yes, ask the king for this or ask the commander-in-chief for that. But what does she answer? She says, I dwell among my people, meaning I live at peace among my people. It is well. I'm doing well. I don't need anything. Just please receive my hospitality. And so Elisha's like, well, what what then can I do for this woman? And Gehazi, very perceptive, he recognizes she has no son, and her husband and her are getting old. How are you going to have children? That's a very great trial. It's a very great trial. Even especially in those days where a son, and if you didn't have a son, who are you going to pass your possessions to? And, and, And if you're Widow, how, how are you going to have a husband in this and children with a husband who's so old? You know, it's very interesting that this is a great burden for many people yet today. 
And many people bear this trial alone as they're childless. And we, with our children, are so blessed and, and, and uh, such a blessing to us. But there are also many who, who are childless, and, and, and they bear this tri trial often many times alone in loneliness. It's interesting that even our government would pay to end the life of children, and yet very few provincial health plans would even cover very many types of reproductive procedures. And even as a church of the Lord Jesus Christ, sometimes we don't know what to say to those who, who are struggling to have children, and, and we need to recognize that this is a very great trial for many people who go through it alone. And yet, this woman is greatly rewarded. She's greatly rewarded through the promise about this time next year, says Elisha, you will embrace a son. And yet, this woman, in her astonishment, is, is, is a little bit apprehensive. No, my Lord, man of God, do not lie to your maidservant. Just be honest with me. Don't promise something that we hope might come to fulfillment. But the word of Elisha the prophet comes true, and as time goes on, the woman conceived, and, and she bore a son, and, 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 and he grew. He's growing up. All things are well. Until we read in verse 18. Now it happened one day that he went out to his father, to the reapers, and he said to his father, my head, my head. And he said to his servant, carry him to his mother. And when he had brought him to his mother, she, he sat on her knees till noon and then died. And very solemn, very sudden. Very suddenly, this woman is devastated. Her child is in her arms, dead. And yet, notice how she deals with this devastating tri trial. She doesn't call for the doctors. She doesn't call for the mourners. She calls for her husband. Oh, that does seems to make sense to us, right? And she, she would call for her husband. And yet, what she tells her husband is not natural. He sa she says, please send me one of the young men and one of the donkeys that I may run to the man of God and come back. She didn't even tell her husband that, her, that their child, their son, had died. Well, I'm not advocating that she should have shouldn't that we shouldn't call and use medical means and doctors and or that we should keep things from our spouses. I'm not advocating for that at all. And yet this woman teaches us something about casting our cares and our burdens upon the Lord in faith. And we have to recognize, don't we, that, that it is not always well in our lives. It is not always well with our children. And, and we confess that even in baptism, that they are born and conceived in sin. We, we understand in our own hearts that it's not always well as we recognize that we have an unbelieving heart and, and we say, I believe, help my unbelief. When we see wayward children going off, we've raised them, we train them in the fear and admonition of the Lord, and yet they go their own ways, and, and we see wayward children, and, and it is not well. Well, what are we to do? We are to act like this woman of faith in Shunem, and we are to plead upon the promises of God, casting our burdens, casting these cares upon Him. And that, that's not being presumptuous. That's not saying, well, my, my, it's going to be all right with my children. It is well, and, and, and I'm just going to forget about it. I don't need to do anything about it because God will do it. No, as a matter of fact, we need to be like this woman. We need to be taking our children to God, pleading upon the promises of God day by day. And even when we're faced with the fact that it's not always well, true faith goes forward in dependence upon God, using the means that God gives us. And so, also at the same time, having this confident spirit in God, in God, and His Word, and His promises. 
And that's why she could tell her husband, it will be well. It will be well. That's our second point. This de- and let's never forget that this woman was a devastated woman. Her only s- son is now lying dead on the, on the bed of the man of God. How did he get there? Well, this woman immediately when he died, he, she recognized that there was... She wanted to bring him to a place where the Word of God had been. The prophetical word in that day was the Word of God through the prophets. And so she goes and she takes him to the bed of the man of God and and shut the door on him and went out and and was going to go to the prophet to hear his word. So she's showing her dependence upon God and the means of grace that he gives and as her husband is called and, and, and asks her, why would you go? And it, why, why would you go to him? It's not Sunday. It's not a Sabbath day. It's not a holy day of any kind. Why would you go to the prophet? And she said, it is well. Or literally, even in your footnotes of your Bible, you can see that it, it could also say, it will be well. It will be well. She has confidence in the Lord that it will be well. And the, and the Hebrew word for this is a word we all know. It's, it's called shalom. Shalom. Peace. It will be well. And this woman who's determined to use the means of grace that God has given she expresses her faith in a very untraditional way here. She, she's the one who calls for the, the donkey and, and, and the young man to take her to the man of God. Wouldn't necessarily be normal in their times for her to do so. And yet faith is untraditional many times as it, as it completely casts itself upon the Lord. And there she goes unto the man of God, determined to get there, telling, telling the young man who's driving the donkey, don't, don't let up unless, unless I tell you Press on, let us go immediately to the man of God. And so it was, we read in verse 25, that as Elisha sees her coming from afar off, that he says to Gehazi, look, the Shunammite woman, go run and meet her and say to her, is it well with you? Is it well with your husband? Is it well with the child? And she says, it is well. You say, it's not well. Your child's dead. Your husband doesn't even know about it. How could it be well? But she says, it is well. And as she comes closer to the man of God, her heart is breaking. Her, her, her whole emotions are being devastated. And, and the questions begin to pour out. And, and she she bows before and clings to the feet of the man of God. And Gehazi came to push her away. But Elisha said, Let her alone, for her soul is in deep distress, and the Lord has hidden it from me and has not told me. Just in this very picture right here, dear parents, you almost see what we began our worship service with in our call to worship, that The disciples were saying, too, keep the little children away from Jesus. And Jesus says, don't keep them away from me. Don't forbid them, but bring them to me. And he embraced them and laid his hands upon them and blessed them. Here is a picture of Gehazi pushing this woman. Strange, strange actions. At the feet of the man of God, push her away. But the man of God says, no, let her sit here for a moment Let her tell me of the distress. The Lord hasn't revealed it all to me. And she says this, Did I ask a son of my Lord? Did I not say, Do not deceive me? Now, she had been saying, It is well. It is well. It is well all the way up to this point. But now, all of a sudden, it is not well. Did I ask a son of my Lord? Did I not say, Do not receive me, deceive me? Well, some commentators see this as a bitter woman accusing the man of God for lying and for her hardship. She would have, she would have rather have not loved at all 
than to have to go through this pain. She would have rather to have never had a son rather than to have to experience the loss of a son. And there is some of that. There's no doubt about it. But other commentators, they really show us that this is faith. This is the faith of this woman openly displaying her emotions and pouring out her heart before the man of God who is a representation of God Himself in their community. And there she pours out her questions and her sorrows and her grief. And she doesn't hold anything back. She casts all of her burdens upon the Lord at the feet of Elisha. And I believe we can, and most confidently can say, that through this passage, the often repeated word shalom is really the focus. This, this was a woman who, yes, was at peace with the Lord, and yet in her very heart, her sorrow, in her bitterness, it's a soul wrestling in faith. And this is the reality of those who grieve and the trials in believers' lives. You wouldn't want to deny that, that, that there's emotions that are tied to it and grief and questions and sorrows in it all. Otherwise, faith would be nothing but stoicism where we can't show any emotions, we can't have any feelings, we, we just have to toughen up and buckle up and, and don't show emotions. As a matter of fact, when we look at all of Scripture, that's not the message of Scripture either, that this woman is just a bitter old woman. There are many questions that Job has, even though he could confess after God had taken everything away from him, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. How often don't the psalmist lay out their complaints before the Lord and yet declares their faith in the Lord Jesus or in the Lord Himself? What about Christ Himself in the garden, in agony, bearing the wrath of God, being pressed upon Him, and He prays to His Father, if it be possible, take this cup from Me, but not My will be done, but Your will be done, as He surrenders to the Lord. Even the saints in heaven cry out, How long, O Lord, will You endure such persecution and let persecution and go on in, in this world and, and sin and blasphemy against who You are? There's questions. There's complaints. You see, the very submissive, confident faith that this woman has, it acknowledges the challenges it acknowledges the grief. It acknowledges the sorrow and the questions that arise and yet perseveres in the Lord. We see that in verse 30. After Elisha had told Gehazi to go back and lay his staff on the child and, and, and the mother of the child says, but as the Lord lives and as, my, as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So he arose and followed her. She doesn't say, notice, as long as you live, Elisha. But she says, first of all, as the Lord lives. Her confidence and her faith is in the Lord. Elisha's going to die sometime as well. She's going to die. And yet, Elisha himself as a prophet of the Lord pointed to a greater prophet, the Lord Jesus Christ, who would come and who would live forever and ever. And so as the long as the Lord lives, I will not leave you, she says. Because she, her confidence was in the God of Elisha. The God who granted salvation through Elisha. And this is the means of grace that, that she's using here, really, in her, in her deepest trials. She's dependent upon God and, and determined to take it all to Him. And that's a picture that we need to follow also in our lives with our children. We need to take our children daily in devotions to the Lord. They need to be, we need to be close to the Lord. We need to be submitting to the Lord in order to have a good, godly, strong family. 
We need to be weekly in the house of God to hear the preaching of the Word where we find there the gospel message and the comfort for all the people of God. We need to be able to see, even as we saw today in the sacraments, that God has ordained them for the strengthening of His people, that it might be well, that there might be shalom, that there might be peace through believing in Christ. We gather together in the communion of saints with the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because the Scriptures say there's peace within the walls of Jerusalem. And within the walls of Jerusalem, we can carry one another's burdens unto the Lord. This woman doesn't have to go to the prophet alone. She could have told her husband. She could have told many other people to come alongside. We have the blessing also of a covenant community. Even in the way of baptism, we commit to one another in the raising of our children. It will be well. How does that apply to how we direct our children in baptism then? Well, first of all, she didn't look to herself to raise the child from the dead. She didn't look to her child She didn't look to anything outside other than God. She didn't just presume that her child was sleeping. She knew he was dead. But she served a God who is all-powerful, a God who gives life, and a God who takes it away. And her confidence and peace was in the Lord, her God. And that needs to be us as we raise our children It is not well by nature with our children. And yet, when we understand what Christ has done, and we understand and submit to Him and and direct them to Him, that He is the only deliverer, we can say in Him it is well. And we can know that He is with us even as we raise our children in the fear of the Lord. And He's no time absent from us. He ever lives to make intercession for us. He prays for us. He preserves us. He loves His own even to the, end of the, and, and to the end of the ages. He is with us and will never leave us nor forsake us. And the end goal of the Lord Jesus Christ is to bring all of His bride, all of His people, all of His sheep unto Him in that eternal wedding feast. And to crown them with crowns and to give them a place in His kingdom of dominion and authority. You see, John Trapp said, a crowned king is what's in store for the children of God. And he says, he that rides to be crowned will not mind a rainy day. You see, we might go through difficulties and trials in raising up our children just as this Shunammite woman did. But as we ride forth, even through a rainy day, a cloudy day, a dark and a stormy day and a stormy night, we will ride on the promise that He has promised in baptism that in the Lord Jesus Christ there is salvation and eternal life. And such life and such faith will be rewarded. It is well. It is well. This was a rewarded woman. Gehazi went ahead of them, laid the staff on the face of the child, but there was neither voice nor hearing. And, and he comes back and it says, the child is not awakened. But when Elisha came into the house, there, there was the child lying dead on his bed. And he went in, therefore, shut the door behind the two of them and prayed to the Lord. Notice there the difference between what Elijah Elisha did in Gehazi, he prayed to the Lord. That's, that's a testimony right away to parents and baptism. The, our hope is in prayer and to use that means of taking our children to the Lord in prayer. And then what did he do? He went up and lay on the child and put his mouth on his mouth and his eyes to his eyes and his hands to his hands and he stretched himself out on the child and the flesh of the child became warm. He returned and walked back and forth in the house and went up and stretched himself out on him. And the child sneezed seven times 
And the child opened up his eyes, and he called Gehazi and said, Call this Shunammite woman. So he called her. And when she had come to him, he said, Pick up your son. This child was really, really dead. This wasn't some kind of mouth-to-mouth resuscitation. He was really dead. As a matter of fact, for this woman to go from Shunem to Mount Carmel on a donkey and back was a round trip of, over, of, of approximately 50 kilometers. That would be like going to parts of Kitchener and back to St. George on a donkey. Well, we know what happens when someone dies. They, they get cold. They, rigor mortis sets in and they, they're, they're really dead. You don't even have to check the pulse after a while. You can tell they are dead. Dead means dead. It wasn't mouth-to-mouth resuscitation. What it was was mouth-to-mouth, eye-to-eye, hand-to-hand, resurrection. Resurrection. It was a miracle of faith. And it pointed to the glorious resurrection of, of the Lord Jesus Christ, ultimately. And our need for resurrection power from Christ. We really catch a further glimpse of God's resurrection power in Luke 7, where Jesus met another woman who had lost a son, a widow of Nain. Now this, this town Nain was like a couple miles away from Shunem. And this woman, too, was lamenting bitterly over the death of her son. And like the Shunammite, this woman from Nain received her son back again unto herself. And this all points to the power that God has to raise us from the dead. He has raised His own Son from the dead. The resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ and is essential to our faith. We talk about the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, how Christ had to suffer and die for our sin. Even in baptism, His blood washes us from our sin. But just as important, equally as important, is His resurrection. You have no gospel without the crucifixion and the resurrection. You need them both. It's essential to the gospel. And the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ is also witnessed in baptism. Notice there, when we confess of what it means to be incorporated into Christ, we are incorporated into His death and into His resurrection. Now, I would never argue that the only mode for baptism is immersion. I believe, as our forum says, that it can be either by immersion or sprinkling or pouring of water. Um, it's not necessarily about the mode. However, I need to also say at the same time, there's something absolutely beautiful about immersion itself. It shows how we are buried with Christ in death and raised with Him in newness of life. It's a symbol. It's not the most important thing about baptism by any means. But it's very symbolic of, of what we confess also in our form and in God's Word that we are buried with Christ in His death and raised with Him in newness of life. And let us never forget, despite the mode of our baptism, that, that this truth is witnessed in baptism. That we are raised with Him in newness of life. And that, that is the answer to the very problem that we all face. It is not well. And we need to be raised from death. Those who are dead in sins and trespasses need to be raised into newness of life through the working of God's Holy Spirit. And this is granted to this woman. She goes in. As she picks up her son, she bows to his feet and, 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 and worships the Lord and goes out. You see, how much more thankful we ought to be. We who have received the full revelation of God's Word. We see it in the sacraments. Today we hear it in the preaching. We are witnesses of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ in His Word. And those who are rewarded through faith go out in faith and bring that good news to the end of the world. 
beginning in our own families, with our own children, in our own communities, and to the end of the world. And so every time someone asks you, how are you? What will you say? Will you say, how much time do you have to listen to my aches and my pains and my difficulties? Or will you say, how much time do you have to listen to the gospel? Shalom. It is well because of what my Savior has done and what He is doing. It is well. When our children ask us, Mommy, Daddy, how are you this morning? It is well. And you share with them why it is well. It is well. Not because of anything we have in ourselves. Not because I'm confident to the water that baptized me or my children. But because of my Savior and because He lives, I will also live. And I will not give up taking my children to the Lord that they might also live. I plead upon His promises. I will make my case known to the Lord. And I will not let Him go until He blesses me and blesses my children with life that He gives. It's because He lives we can face tomorrow. We know that Him, how God sent His Son, and they called Him Jesus. He came to love, heal, and forgive. He lived and died to buy my pardon. An empty grave is where is there to prove my Savior lives. And because He lives, I can face tomorrow. Even though we don't understand the future, and we have to say, God willing, all the more, even in times of COVID and COVID restrictions and then illnesses that go along with it. And we have to postpone things. But I know because He lives, I can face tomorrow. And because He lives, all fear is gone. I live, we live in a fearful day. Many challenges in this life. We have lots of fears all around us. It's a fearful thing to raise children today. But because He lives, all fear is gone. Because I know He holds the future and not me, not my children, not our Prime Minister. He holds the future. God holds the future. And because He lives, I can face tomorrow. So how sweet it is to hold a newborn baby and feel the pride and joy it gives, but greater still the calm assurance this child can face on certain days because he lives. How are you? It is well. He lives. He reigns. He was raised. Isn't that why we also pray for our children? And pray that they too one day will cross the river and not have to fear the judgment and condemnation of God, but that when they cross the river, even as we sang earlier in our service, that there we'll know that I can say, when peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well. It is well with my soul. How are you? Can you say, Shalom? It is well. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we give thanks for your gospel. We give thanks for your glorious resurrection. And we pray, Lord, that you would bless us with confidence, a confident faith. 
and through all the testing and the trials of faith here below, and we can say, it is well. Lord, be pleased to reward us with that faith, that hope, that confidence, and that we, O oh Lord, with our children, would stand with you on that last day when death gives way to victory, and there we see, indeed, our Savior lives. And so, Lord, go with us throughout this day, and we would set our hope on you and you alone. Go with us throughout this week as well. We think of this afternoon. We pray that you would be with and Pastor David Van Brugge also as he brings your word to us here in St. George. And as I serve the Hamilton congregation, we pray, Lord, that you would strengthen us and in our callings and our labors and bless his ministry among us in this afternoon to the glory of your name. And go with us throughout this week, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.